So I'm going to start off a little bit, and Dr. Speck's going to chime in here, in and out here. Um, this is one of my favorite sort of memes. Um, the hydrogen monoxide is deliberately sprayed on organic crops. Does this concern anybody? <laughs> okay. I, we live in a society that most of you realize that you say something that people don't understand really fast, they get concerned, especially when it has to do with their food or the way we live. And, you know, if you don't remember your basic chemistry, dihyd dihydrogen monoxide can be very scary, okay? If, for those of you who are in AgCom and don't remember your chemistry, it's okay. This would be water. <laughs> Just the... Just so you know. So we think it's really important, and that was sort of the idea behind this, is we think it's really important that you guys, as educated scientists and educated um, communications professionals, understand how to take this information and make it so it's comfortable for consumers and make it something that they can understand. So what we want to talk about today um, is we want to talk about how we reach people online. If you look at social media, there's typically, if you look at your audience on social media, the people you're touching, about 20% are the haters about what topic you're interested in. They're the people who are not going to agree with you no matter what you do. Okay? You've probably got about 20% who are like you, who have the same belief system, the same background. And then there's going to be about 60% out there that you really need to touch. Okay? And when we talk about communicating online, We've got to be understanding that we are not going to change this 20%. The chances of us doing that is really slim. So what we're trying to do with social media and as we tell our story and we talk about science online is we're trying to hit that 60%. And so that's what today and our discussion on December 2nd is going to be a little bit more about is how do we hit that 60% and make them comfortable with the science that we're comfortable with and make them not afraid of dihyd dihydrogen monoxide. All right, so what we're gonna do briefly tonight is we wanna talk about how we brand yourself as credible because it doesn't matter what we say online if somebody doesn't see you as a credible source. So it's always gonna have to go back to who are you on social media before you even think about what set story you're gonna tell. Then we wanna talk a little bit about sort of crafting those stories and that content. And then we're going to take it down a little bit into what are some of the specific tools and some specific tips with those tools. And then we're going to practice this crafting the message for one of those tools. Okay? So sound good with me? All right, nobody's leaving yet, so we're, we're doing good. So the biggest thing you have to think about on social media is you have to be yourself. If you talk to any social media marketer, any social media researcher, the most important thing you can do is be yourself because there is nobody else out there like you. And who you are as a person, your background, your expertise is what's going to make you the person that people are going to trust. So whatever story you have is what's going to connect you to others. So I want you to think about the social media. How many of you guys have Facebook? Okay, how many of you have Twitter? Instagram, Snapchat, Periscope. Okay, this is where I get to see those who are really into social media. Who are you on these social networks? Think about it. What kind of things do you post on a daily basis? Are you posting pictures of your food? Are you posting pictures of your significant other or your dog? What are you posting? Okay, because... If I spend my whole life posting about my two-year-old daughter and then all of a sudden I decide to throw a post up about the science behind GMOs, how am I an expert on GMOs when the only thing I've ever talked about is my two-year-old daughter attacking her kitten? That doesn't give me credibility, right? So you've got to think from day one, if you want to be a, somebody who's on social media sharing a story being an expert, you've got to set yourself up as that. So everything from how you present your bio, 
how you post your photo and select the photo of yourself. Okay? And again, we could spend hours just on that. But I think it's most important that as you start this process and we think about how you're going to do the activities with this group or with just your own social advocacy, how are you framing yourself online? Do you want to be a student expert? Do you want to be a research expert? Do you just want to be a general consumer? You know, as a researcher at the university, I always struggle. Do I, do I put myself on social media as a researcher and as an Ohio State person? Do I put myself on social media as a mother? Do I put myself on social media as a farmer because I live on a farm and have a farming husband? How do I present myself? And how is that going to affect the people who watch what I'm saying? Okay. And if you find, if you're working for a research entity like an Ohio State University, what I put out there, if I'm presenting myself as that, has to be watched versus what I put myself out as my personal opinion. Okay. So how are you framing that person online? That's going to come into play as you story. The best thing you can do is be you. You know, Dr. Seuss, I love that day you are you, it's truer than true, no one alive who is youer than you. I know that, that seems childish, but on social media, the reason social media is so popular and the reason blogs took off and the reason Facebook took off so quickly was because it was finally a media that people could trust. We don't always necessarily trust television or reporters, because they have an agenda, right? Or so we think. Hopefully they don't, but we like to think they do. Social media, your agenda is you. And so the more you can be you on social media, and you frame yourself as you, the more people are going to trust what you're saying. Right? So you have to think about who are you framing yourself out? Who is that brand? It is you. I am not going to go on social media and pretend I know everything about food science. I don't know anything about food science. I don't research that. Some of you guys do that and know it well. So if I'm going to talk about that, I should be citing you. I shouldn't be acting as an expert that I'm not. Right? And people will see through that. I've talked to people who've run Huffington Post, so sort of one of the, the founding members of Huffington Post. And the one thing that always stuck with me that he has said is, you always share everything about you. You share your struggles. You share your, you know, the wins. You share the challenges. And that hits really hard with agriculture and natural resources. People don't trust us because they don't understand it. So we have to be ourselves online. We have to be completely transparent. And as we talk about stories and as we get into our activity, a lot of that is, are you being you and are you being transparent and showing that, that you know, not putting up a facade, right? It, if you aren't being yourself, it doesn't matter how well you craft a message. People can see through it, right? So who are you and how, how do you want to share that? And I know this is a lot of text, and it's like death by PowerPoint right here, so bear with me. But as you think about who you are online, you need to figure out who is your community online. Who are you going to talk to? Because again, who is that story going to? Who is your audience? What community you are you a part of? If you look at websites like Huffington Post, Slate, all of these online magazines that have been so popular, BuzzFeed, what they've done is they found a community that they fit in and they've shared their stories in those communities. They found a fit and a niche. And so you got to figure out what that is. Are you going to be somebody who comes into a community and is just there to pass on information and you're just continually going to share links? Or are you going to share original content? What, what is your purpose? You know, are you there to answer questions about people or about products? Maybe you want to be that person who, if somebody's online and is talking about GMOs, that you can answer that. 
or if they're talking about um, ingredients or fresh milk versus pasteurized milk. Are you that expert? Are you going to try and answer questions for people? What community are you going to be in? At some point, you might be a parent. Are you going to be in you know, a community of other parents? Are you going to be in community at your work? your church group, your local soccer league, whatever that is, how are you going to fit into that community and share this story? Okay. So how can you re talk with people? How can you reward people and, and sort of surprise people by being that resource for your community? You know, the biggest thing we're going to do with social media is build relationships. Again, it doesn't matter the story, the words of the story, until you have a relationship with somebody, they're not going to listen. And that goes back to being you. So if you want to be somebody that people trust, and you want to be somebody that people look at their posts and say, she knows what she's talking about when it comes to you know, food safety, then you need to make sure that you've got networks that help build that. Who are the experts out there? If I want to be an advocate, you know, on our farm, I try, and, I try and advocate about things we do on our farm. If I want to do that well, I have to look at who are the other influencers out there, and I need to connect with them. See how they're telling their story to their audience. What can I learn from them? Okay. If somebody's successful, what can you learn from them? And how can you build a relationship with them to where they start sourcing you. And having a relationship that you're responding in real time, that you're talking to people. You're not that person who jumps onto social media and tells your story a couple times and then is gone for a few months. Okay? So that being said, don't look at my social media because I've done that recently. With traveling, I wasn't active for a few months. And what it does is it, you lose your credibility when you do that. Okay? So make sure you're being, you're there, you're being valuable to those relationships. Yeah. Right, so, so the question was, um, where is that sort of line? At what point do you, are you not, you know, do you lose that credibility because you're not doing it enough versus when are you doing it so much that you're losing credibility because you're that person? I, I said this in my social media class the other day and they all laughed at me, but I love this analogy. Think about it as a party, okay? You walk into the party, you've always got that one person who's sort of shy over in the corner that never really says anything. You've got the person who's the belligerent drunk who's trying to get everybody's attention, yelling and screaming all the time. And you sort of have that other person who's sort of cool and goes from group to group and, you know, is the one everybody likes. Okay? We don't want to be the belligerent drunk in social media. We don't want to be that person who's always out there screaming stuff. Okay? But we also don't want to be that shy person that nobody remembers is even sitting in the room. So it, it's a fine line. You don't want to be posting every five minutes that you're annoying to people, but you also don't want to not post for months on end. Okay? Does that answer? Does that help? It, it's, a, it's a fine line. And part of it is, is looking at who those influencers are, looking at how often they post. How often are they saying things? And the people that are following, how often are they responding? Because that's going to influence you and in how much should you be posting. Okay? Because somebody who's 40 is going to be on social media less than somebody your age. So if my community and my audience is 40-year-olds, it's okay if I don't post every day. But if it's your, audience, your age group, I might need to be posting every day, if not multiple times. Okay? Good question. Um, Sometimes, I, I like this, sometimes it's not what you say that matters, it's what you don't say. Right? And I'm going to come back to this again um, in a little bit when we talk about naysayers. But with social media, sometimes it's not necessarily what you're not saying, or sometimes it's not necessarily what you're saying, it's what you're not saying. Sometimes it's what you show as well, the images. So as we talk about some of these things and who you are, and how you're setting up your credibility and how you're setting up your story. It's being that transparent. It's the imagery, the words that you say. 
And especially with science, when we tell the stories with science, people question things. And so if you're not being honest and showing every angle to things, they start questioning you. So we have to not be afraid to talk about the touchy subjects. We have to not be afraid to talk about what is a GMO, what is you know, pasteurized milk, what is such and such chemical in our food. We can't be afraid to talk about it. If we've set up ourselves as an expert, as somebody who knows something on this topic, people are going to trust you. And when you don't talk about it, people are going to start wondering why you're not talking about it. Okay, and I'm going to show you some examples of that here in a minute. Last thing I want to say about who you are before we go into your stories is you want to make sure people find you. Okay? You can spout off all you want about science, but if nobody can find you, it's not going to matter. So you want to make sure you become an expert. And one way you do that is making sure people can find you in search engines and searching things out. And that's why we have things like hashtags, and why we've said use citation needed, or use the college hashtag, or your organization hashtag, or whatever topic, um, you know, understanding GMO, or whatever topic that is, using those hashtags so people can search and find you becomes really <coughs> important. Right? So make sure that you, you're findable. So your story, once you know that you, you feel good about who you're showing yourself, what is that story that you're going to share? How are you going to connect through the story? The first thing you have to do is what do people want to hear? What do people question? Just because you think they're questioning how cheesecake is made doesn't mean people are questioning how cheesecake is made. I know that's a terrible example. but. You've got to learn, listen to what people are talking about. And that goes back to who are those experts and what are they talking about. What's the topic that is really of interest right now? One of the worst things we do in agriculture, and not necessarily as much in natural resources, but definitely in agriculture, we like to make stories where there is no story. We like to draw attention to things that people aren't questioning. A couple years ago, Chipotle put out a wonderful ad campaign against animal agriculture. It was something that probably would have died pretty fast if everybody in agriculture hadn't jumped on social media and started jabbering about it and sharing it and sharing it and sharing it. It probably would have died a lot quicker than what it did. Okay? So what do people really care about? Talk about that. Okay? We don't need to hide things. We also don't need to push things that aren't of concern and make them a concern. Um, an, another recent example of that, um, and actually something that Ashlyn, uh, my grad student, and I are working on, is looking at water quality issues. Um, especially, we, we just did a study looking at social media conversation around um, the Columbus nitrates issue. You guys remember that when you couldn't drink the water here in Columbus mm -hmm. because it would make you sick? Summer. Yeah, just this summer. Um, and. A lot of people were talking, a lot of people we assumed were talking about agriculture's role in that. Well, we looked at the social media da data and agriculture wasn't really getting talked about. Um, it was more about rain and more about the health effects. And we kind of, again, made it into more of a story than it probably would have been otherwise. So I, I concur with Dr. Buck. You have to be really careful about being transparent but not pushing items on the agenda that aren't already on the agenda. One thing, it goes back to who you are online. But when you think about a story, if you're going to tell a story about some type of science or some type of information you want to share, the best thing you can do is let people feel who you are as you're telling that story. Right? Let people feel your heartbeat. <laughs> let them see your passion, your understanding, your caring behind something as you tell that story. And it, it really, I, I put this here because it really ties on who you are with that story. If it's not something you're passionate about, don't start talking about it. Because people will see through it really fast. So as we think about a story, 
What kind of story would you would you talk about? Think about the things that you're you're seeing in class, you're hearing in class. Think about the conversations you have with your peers that you're seeing on social media. Come up with an area that you're passionate about, that you think you should talk about. Like I said, I shouldn't be the one telling people why we put certain chemicals in food, but I can talk about why I do certain things with my animals on my farm. So think about what is that story that you have that you can share. Just because we're passionate and I care about GMOs, I may not be the expert. So I shouldn't necessarily be the one talking about it. If I am the one talking about it, I'm going to be sharing other people's stories. Okay? Citing other people's things, not just my own. So I like this. I'm the person who created it. I am GMO. Telling that story. Telling your story becomes really, really important. As we think about what that story is going to be, you need to determine what is the message you're trying to get across. If it's a thing you're passionate about, what is the thing you're trying to get across? Are you just trying to raise awareness on an issue? Are you trying to raise awareness on foodborne illnesses? Or what we do in terms of animal handling in agriculture? Or how we're taking care of water quality in Ohio? Are you trying to do awareness? Are you trying to develop opinion? Or are you trying to change behavior? Because the way you're going to write that message is going to be different. How many of you have taken a speech class? A lot of you. How many of you have ever had to write an opinion paper? It's the same concept. It's just using a different tool. If you want to encourage somebody to just understand a topic, you're going to be out there telling them all of the facts and different issues that go along with that topic. But if you're trying to get somebody to change their behavior, you're going to have to give them reasoning behind that. You can't just do the surface level. You're going to have to go deeper as you tell that story. So think about what is, what is the big picture of that topic. And we're going to give you some, story, some research here in a minute. And we're going to have you think about what is the big picture of that. And based on that big picture, what are the few things you want to make sure that your audience is getting out of that big picture? So if I want to talk about why I vaccinate animals and why I think it's beneficial, you know, what are the two or three supporting statements I have? One, I'm not going to spend extra money if I don't have to. Two, I just want my animals healthy, just like I would want my child healthy. And then what, what would that other third one be? Or maybe it's only two. We talk about media training. A lot of times people will talk about sort of a message house, where you have a house of all of the messages you want to get it across on that one issue. And you've got to realize you're not going to be able to get across a ton of things. You can only get across a couple topics around one issue. So what are those topics? And then what is your proof? And that's where being you comes into play. Telling your story. Having a story that you can relate. Okay? And I think I've got, you know, and making sure it's a story that they can relate to. I would guarantee about half the people in this room could start talking food science stuff to me and I wouldn't know a word you were saying. And I have a PhD. But I don't have a PhD in that. You've got to make sure that as you start crafting that and thinking about it, what words are you going to use? Okay? I love this example. If I say producer to people in agriculture, what do they think of? Farmer, okay? Any other thoughts? If I say producer to somebody in downtown Cleveland, what are they going to think? Hmm? Music? Music, arts? 
we have to choose our words, our imagery very carefully. Agriculture, science, we have a bad problem of using jargon. Okay? And I, I love the example of producer because in agriculture and natural resource, we talk about producers all the time. Well, that doesn't mean anything to somebody who doesn't know that background. So as you're thinking about what are these issues and what are this message you're going to talk about, what words, how are you going to explain things to connect it to somebody? I always like to say in, in my classes, you are not the person you're talking to. Right? Just because you understand it doesn't mean they understand it. So just because a term makes sense to you doesn't mean it makes sense to everybody else. Hydrogen monoxide. Or I die hydrogen monoxide. See, I'm not a chemist at all. You know, what do those terms mean? As we think about that message, and as we're going to have you practice messaging, how does that come into play? I threw this in here. This some research done. Um, gosh, it's probably been three or four years ago now, but it's still sort of interesting. They did some consumer researching, looking at cons and consumers and what they think about agriculture. And they found that consumers trust farmers because they relate to them. They have that idealistic view, that romanticized view, so they trust them. You know, they want wholesomeness, but they also realize that the romanticized view is somewhat just that. Consumers are fickle. People are fickle. We try and read through things. We are in a society today that we don't trust messages. So we're always trying to look through that. You know, most of what agriculture says today, and I would say most of a lot of what science says today, doesn't resonate with people. Because we're trying to say it in our own terms. We have to say it in their terms, right? And I said before, the worst thing we can do is answer the question they are not asking. And research has shown that again and again and again. You know, we have to show that there's common interests between us and whoever we're talking to. Um, I, I love this. This is two examples of messaging done. I don't know this is necessarily food, but this is agriculture. I'm going to show you some food here in a second. Taking off the barriers, being who we are, and showing what we do. Okay? I didn't want to put up every photo. This is a dairy farm. Where they're from. I want to say Minnesota or Wisconsin, but that's where all dairy farmers are from, so I shouldn't assume that. This was a, a um, Delta has a serious problem. They knew the, the people who were watching were probably people who had families. They knew they wanted to share what was happening on their farm. They wanted to raise that veil of agriculture that people say is there. So they posted a photo series of a veterinarian. Hello, you're fine. Of, of a veterinarian pulling a calf. And they were very blunt in explaining from photo to photo what the vet was doing. Okay. Now, I'm not saying you're all going to go outside tonight and find a calf that's giving a calf and having an issue and doing this. But I wanted you to see it's okay to broach and do stories that might not seem, you know, kosher and, and pretty. Because people are going to trust you by showing the real thing. So they were very careful in how they messaged it. So they went from, you know, she's having a problem, we're worried about her. So the vet came out to check. To, we're laying her down on her side so she's more comfortable. To, just as a human doctor would be looking to see if a human baby was in the right position, vet so-and-so is looking to see if the calf is in the right position. Obviously, it's not an animal science class, so I'm not going to go much more in depth than that. But, you know, I, I wanted you to see this example. And then this example, this is a story. It's a letter to Subway, Chipotle, and they hashtag seafood, which I didn't really get that. But what they did was they did an open letter about one of their calves, a calf who came on a feedlot with foot rot. And they were talking about, this, this whole rant is about how, it, it's really cute how they do it, because they talk about, um, 
calf number is such and such. His mom called him Moo, but since I don't read, understand cow, I call him Davy. And Davy had something wrong with his hoof, and I wanted to make sure that he was okay. So I gave him just enough antibiotic to make him better. And he's going to be on my farm for 150 some days, and I want to make sure that he's safe and that the antibiotic says he can go into the food supply after 28 days. And it's sort of this whole, this is what we're doing and why we're doing it. Okay. Again, it doesn't matter if we're talking about food safety, if we're talking about you know, the chemicals behind things. It's all the same idea of being open in your message and, and showing it and being truthful and honest. Okay. And having a little fun with it and showing your personality. There was no need for them to say, I don't speak moo, so I'm going to call him Davy. No, that was cute. That showed the person's personality. It made you feel a connection with them. Okay. So I, I, I left that so you didn't have to see the hoof rot. Um, fun video. Hello YouTube, I'm Hamish Todd at the International Rice Research Institute and I'm working on C4 rice, one of humanity's best chances for alleviating world hunger. So today about a billion people suffer from undernourishment and dwindling resources and a growing population mean that this number could grow by several more billion. The C4 rice project offers a way to help this though. Rice is the most widely grown food in the world, but the thing is that on a molecular level the leaves of the rice plant can sometimes be pretty terrible at what they do. We want to make them more like the leaves of plants like sugarcane, which as I'll explain in this video, use a technique called C4 photosynthesis to process air in a way that's safer for the plant. If we can make rice leaves do C4 photosynthesis, then farmers will be able to secure vastly more food without expending any extra resources. This is why the goal of C4 rice has brought together an international team of dozens of scientists, mainly based here in the Philippines. And along the way towards that goal, we have learned some pretty awesome things. So. Here's C4 rice explained in eight minutes. The place we have to start is photosynthesis, that most wonderful process by which plants and also algae and some other strange organisms turn light and carbon dioxide into food for themselves. Photosynthesis is extremely important. Living things need energy, and directly or indirectly we get it all from that inexhaustibly hot and shiny thing that is currently behind that cloud over there and which I wish could be nicer to the skin of redheads. Using the sun to photosynthesis synthesized food is how the majority of life on Earth gets by. Animals like humans can come off as a bit pathetic next to plants because we can only survive off the food that they have already photosynthesized for us. There were organisms that did okay before photosynthesis came along, but to find food they had to live in volcanoes and places like that. So when photosynthesis arrived it was a gigantic leap forward. All the more impressive is that photosynthesis became this ridiculously complicated process enlisting dozens of weirdly interacting machines across several completely separate production lines. Though fortunately, we do not have to know every little thing about photosynthesis. To understand C4 rice, the only molecule you need to know about is this one. This is Rubisco, an indispensable tool for photosynthesis that first evolved along with the rest of the process. Okay, we won't watch all eight minutes because I don't want to scare anybody who's not into photosynthesis. What do you think about that? What did you gather from that? Yeah, he was talking so fast. He did a great job of like inputting a couple of, like little humorous things like trying to relate to you but he was talking so fast with terms that if you're not a, a scientist could could trip you up really fast yeah summer <laughs> you understood the the sun issue <laughs> I, I, I thought it was, what's interesting is this video was sent to me by a um media marketing person who thought this was a ex wonderful example of how we could take a complex subject and show it in agriculture. And I'm like, wait a minute, <laughs> that, that confused me within two seconds. Anything to add? Um, I think, let me see if I can escape from this real quick. Got another one, I think. Yep. Now let's watch this one. I know Matt's going to be mad at me for this one. Dihydro linoleuloxa. I can't say. Two heptano. Heptano. I'm gonna practice these. Hi everybody. Today we're gonna to talk about chemicals and chemicals inside your food. What's in a blueberry? Methyl three methyl butanoate. 
2 heptanone. Dihydrolinol oxide, 6 methyl 5 heptanone. A banana. 3 methyl butyl pentanoate. 5 hydroxymethyl furfural. 3 methyl butanal. Ethyl acetate. Eggs! <laughs> Dimethyl trisulfide. 2 5 dimethyl pyrazine. 2 methyl propane nitrile. Acetophenone. Food is chemical by nature. When you smell something, when you taste something, all of those are chemicals. I really taste the ethyl acetate. So what do you think about that one? Ignore the, the people in the audience or <laughs> that are in the video or in the audience. Yeah, they're saying a lot of wor big words, but they're saying it short little clips that are moving you through it. Yeah. Yeah, you'd be a surprise with marketing. There's a lot of marketing research on the video, the music behind things, the lighting behind things, and the feel that you can give people. So just by the fact that it was upbeat and bright and, and happy music, that alone just gave you a positive feel for the whole topic. Imagine that with the Jaws soundtrack behind yeah. it. It's a completely different video. You would be scared of what? Berries, bananas, and eggs. eggs. <laughs> so, you know, and, th and that's a great example of you know, showing your personality, being you, it's something that doesn't take that much time. You know, that's the other thing about social media is we have to remember that we can make an impact using social media and talking about science without taking a ton of time. You know, sometimes we feel like we have to make this huge, exaborant, um, exaborant, that's not a word, wow. Elaborate. I was getting to the end of the day. Elaborate, thank you. <laughs> um, a huge elaborate production. You don't. You know, that's quick editing, just some words, some music behind it. Nice, nice and clean. Okay. A couple of you know, an overall message, a couple points, sort of, and then that end, you know, what we want to leave you with. Okay. I didn't want to leave out imagery. Imagery is huge. You know, you don't necessarily have to create images, but if you can find images that you can share that show things like how many hormones are in cattle, you know, amount in food versus estrogen in humans. You know, there's, I forget what that's like, two, I forget what the, two milligrams in beef versus 100 and, or what, 19 million, 600 in a pregnant woman. You know, that kind of imagery can have a huge impact because you're seeing it. Um, you, know, you only get a few seconds with your social media messages. That second one hit us because it was quick, it was fast. It kept our attention. The attention span in humans has gone down immensely. You guys in class, your instructor loses you probably within a few minutes. Where when I was in class, they at least had 10. Okay, so you know we have to make sure that you only have a short amount of time. So if, with your story, you've got to engage them quickly. You've got to make it clear, and you've got to tell them what you're hoping for out of it. Okay? And keeping it visual. Oh no, are you sure? I, I, I like questions. That just specs like wrap it up so we can get to the other part. Okay. <laughs> Um, I, I wouldn't be an ag communicator if I didn't at least mention grammar and how you present yourself. You've got to make sure that you're using short sentences, that you're using correct facts, you're using words the right way, you know, you're, you're using descriptions, you're linking to sources, all of those kinds of things are going to help with your credibility. The minute you have a misspelled word, your credibility is gone. The minute you mislink something, your credibility is gone because you didn't take that extra second to check it. So they're wondering, do you actually know what you're talking about? You know, using active voice. Don't be using words like no, you know, don't use those words like be, am, is, are, was, were. Use active voice. Draw people in. 
use pronouns like you, we, making it personal makes a huge impact. And if you're going to do anything like a blog or something longer, go back to basic. High school English, one topic per paragraph. Okay. We as scientists, and I'm as an academician, I'm very aware of, I like to use big words, I like to use complex sentences, make myself so, sound smart. Everybody with a PhD does it. That's not going to get a consumer to understand. And that's not going to get the general public to understand. Right? You need to be writing to a much lower reading level than what you're used to. That just reminds me that the thought of academic language. I was in a meeting with another faculty member a couple of weeks ago, and he was talking about what he had done that weekend. And he said, well, I'm, I'm in this musical collaboration group. And he goes, I mean, I'm in a band. Don't be in a musical collaboration group, guys. Be in a band, OK? <laughs> Such a great. <laughs> that is good. You know, the other thing you have to think about is where and when you're going to post this stuff. Everybody in class, I always get the question, and when I do social media presentations for industry people, it's always the question, when's the best time to post? Is it at 7 AM, or is it noon? When is the best time? The answer to that question is, is who are you talking to? Looking at, that's where building that relationship and looking at that community, when are they posting the most? That's when you post your story. Because if it's a mom like me, it's probably 10 o'clock at night when my daughter's in bed or Saturday morning before she's awake. That's when I'm playing on social media. If it's a college student, it's probably 9 o'clock when they're sitting in class. Okay? A business professional, probably noon, 1 o'clock after lunch when they come back or right before they go home. It's, there is no magic hour like we have with radio or print or television. It's when is your audience you're trying to talk to online? Okay? And where where are they? So I want to make sure we have enough time to practice. So a couple tools, I want to just go over a couple tools and a couple quick tips with some of these tools. And we'll talk about more on some of our other events that we're mm -hmm. doing too. But um, quick tools to think about. If you're going to use Facebook, some of the top tools with using Facebook, asking questions and any social media platform is huge because you start engaging people. So if you want them to, you know, if you want to have a discussion about pasteurized milk, start asking questions about it. And what do people know? What do they want to know? And then adding to that conversation. Incorporating photos. Photos are huge in social media. It's something like 50% increase in views in social media if you have an image. Okay, so photos, photos, photos. Videos, finding videos. You don't have to make the video. Grab Matt's video, link to it, and then start a conversation around it. You know, um, talk about current events. How can that relate to what you're interested in? So if I'm interested in antibiotic use, this is Antibiotic Awareness Week. Great time to start talking and having a conversation on social media about it. Okay. So think about those kinds of things. What links can you use and what Facebook is one where it's good to do a call for action and ask people to do things. Feel free to chime in if you know any others. Twitter, Twitter is great for events. If you're going to go to an event where you're at something like this and you want to start a conversation with people who are following you, or if you hear a speaker say something, I always like to, if I'm at something and someone says something, or in class and your instructor says something, start a conversation with it. Tweet about it. Don't let them catch you, because sometimes instructors don't like it when you're on your phone. Watch what's getting shared. What are other people sharing? Using graphics on Twitter. We don't necessarily think with 140 characters that graphics is important, but it is. Okay. Participating in chats. How many of you have ever t looked at a food chat, or an ag chat, or any other type of tweet up? and participated in it and shared. How do I know it's antibiotic day? Because one of the groups I follow put out something. They were doing a whole Twitter chat from 11 to 12 today all on antibiotic use, and they wanted farmers to chime in. 
follow those kinds of things. Look at those. Repeat things that you see. And don't be afraid to address people. Did I put the wrong hash? I put the wrong one up there, didn't I? We I had to update it because it was too long. So it's OSU need to cite teach. Or new, yeah. 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 Yes, <laughs> OSU need to cite. This is what happens OSU. when you keep faculty members on campus after 6 o'clock. Especially one who's had the flu this week. So, um, you know, this is a great, this is the one I was saying. I followed these guys this morning. They said, got questions about antibiotic resistance? Ask a farmer today. Follow. If you have relationships with people, you find out about these things to where you can be involved and make those conversations and share those things. Because if I started tweeting as part of this conversation, I guarantee my followers are going to see it, and they're probably going to start asking me questions. Pinterest, how many of you do Pinterest? How many of you think of Pinterest as a place to advocate or talk about science? It is, 100%, because it is a very specific audience that follows Pinterest, and they are a very vocal audience when it comes to food. Okay, So a great place to do where you can pin things, not even just images, but videos about certain scientific topics, finding those images and sharing them you know, having boards where you talk about food safety. And if people know you and see you as a credible source, they're going to follow that. You know, sharing your pins on your other social media. The biggest trick to social media is network it all together. So if you tweet, it goes out on your Facebook. Something similar goes out on your Instagram. Something similar goes out on your Pinterest. You get more bang for your buck. Okay? Having secret boards. If you and your friends are passionate about this, you know, if you're going to do a citation needed group and be part of our group, why not have a board that's secret just for you guys to share your ideas? You know, we, I've done this with other instructors where we've shared educational activities we found on Pinterest. Yes, those kinds of things are up there. Instagram. You know, images are huge. How can you use images? How can you source images? Hashtags. How many hashtags do you use on something? What's the limit? Two, three. Three is probably your limit. You start getting too much. The biggest thing that it does is it makes it less easy to share. If you, have, if you kill people with hashtags, they're not going to be able to share it on other things like Twitter. Okay. You're not going to be able to, they're going to be sick of seeing so many hashtags, they lose the text that you've put with it. And the biggest thing with Instagram is not just the photo, but the caption you're adding to it. The context that you're putting that photo in becomes really important. Okay? Hashtags, don't necessarily make up your own hashtags. Look at what other hashtags are being used and how can you join those conversations. Unless you have your own personal hashtag that you use for things. Okay? And surprisingly, Instagram filters, research shown, they share are shared more if you're using some type of filter. They just capture attention more. That being said, don't use so many filters that the photo is unrecognizable. But a filter here or there can make it more impactful. Meerkat Periscope, if you haven't heard about these, probably should look into them. Periscope's more popular than Meerkat. Um, this is one that a lot of PR marketing people are starting to really jump on board with. Okay? Basically, it's live video streaming. Okay? It's great if you want to have a conversation with somebody. There's a lot of companies doing with like their CEOs having Q&As with people, live Q&As. I told my class the other day, I started periscoping feeding the sheep one afternoon. And within like three seconds, I had 40-some people following me feeding my sheep. Okay? Cause, and I, all I did was I, I put as the title, Farm Life. And enough people were interested in that. Okay? This is one of the new hot ones. If you haven't used it, and there's always a new hot one on the block, this is the one that, you know, jump on. There's not a lot of people having a conversation. So if you're the one up there having a conversation that's going to help your cause, more power to you before it gets so, you know, hard to be found, like a Facebook. 
So looking at it, how can you do unique engagement type things? We should have been periscoping this today. We should have. You did? Awesome. Very I love periscope. Um, Google Plus, anybody on Google Plus? Okay. Google Plus, interesting for Google Hangouts. Um, talk to Dr. Specht a little bit more about that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through that. She's done some really cool things with Google Hangouts, bringing people to um, like actual, taking kids to farms without them being on a farm. Okay. Taking people to your lab without them having to be in your lab and actually letting them ask questions. Mm -hmm. okay. In Snapchat, as, as odd as Snapchat is, still a resource that's good to share stories on. Okay? Especially if you use sort of that, that story function of Snapchat. With that, um, I'm going to say one more thing and then I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Speck. One thing I wanted to, I said, don't let anything be off limits. People are going to, you're always going to have that 20% that hate you and you've got to be ready to answer that 20%. Okay? And understand that when you answer that 20%, you're not answering them, you're answering the 60% that are watching. Okay? So never get in a fight with a troll online. Ask them what their experience with it is. Are they the expert? Ask them what, why they're saying this. Maybe state your point and let it go. If you sit there and argue with them, it looks worse for the other people watching. Okay? So I, I want to you know, agree to disagree. That really makes them mad but it makes you the one who's taking the high road. 